What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Saturdays in the SEC, episode 137. Back to recap uh, a crazy week 11 in the SEC. Um, I believe it was last week I compared the SEC race was kind of like the Kentucky Derby in turn three. We got all the horses fanned out, and uh, Ole Miss and Alabama just threw a wrench in that even more so. I feel like uh, even more uh, up in the air after week 11, after some of these results, uh, it's going to come down to the wire here. We we got tiebreaker scenarios all over the board. Um, it's going to be a fascinating, you know, final few weeks in the SEC to see who's going to get to go to Atlanta. Um, we got the playoff rankings uh, actually coming out any minute here. We're recording on Tuesday night, so we we may get a little live breakdown of that going on uh, when they come out shortly. So, um, yeah, to kind of jumping into week 11, though, um, Ole Miss, uh, Lane Kiffin, really with a program-defining win. You know, this is what um, they built all offseason for. That's what they invested so heavily in this 2024 team. It was to beat teams like Georgia. Um, you know, they built their defensive lines, um, you know, one of the best units in the country. Um, I think that that showed up big time on Saturday. I mean, that's what they built all offseason for. That's what they've been building for that moment to be able to beat elite teams, um, you know, kind of we've talked about that Georgia-Alabama type of hump they haven't been able to get over yet. They were finally able to conquer that hurdle uh, on Saturday. I think a, a huge win for for Lane Kiffin as a head coach, huge win for the program as a whole, but specifically this 2024 Ole Miss team who seems to really be playing their best football at the right time. I mean, everything's ahead of them. I'm really fascinated to see where they're ranked tonight uh, after that win and, and a couple couple uh, upsets on Saturday. So it's going to be really fascinating to see. Give me your thoughts on on the game and kind of Ole, Ole Miss as a whole headed down this final stretch of the season. Yeah, they were a completely different ball club than we've seen the last, you know, against Kentucky. You know, you look back against Kentucky, uh, them losing that game. That's the one that really stands out to me. Uh, they're completely different ball club, and they were amped up, ready to go. <clears throat> Lane still had them wired and ready, but like you you mentioned, their defensive front, they built it. That was their 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 main focus was to to get them to compete to the elite level. Was they needed a, a strong defensive front, and man, they showed out. Uh, were all over Carson Beck all night. Tip passes. I mean, they they had tips some tip passes. Stuffed the run extremely well. They were all over Carson Beck. I'm not sure how many sacks did they end with. I, I don't remember five or six. I feel like. Um, I don't I don't have it in front of me, but I, I know it was they were all over him all night. Uh, I thought they played extremely well. Defensive backs played really well. I I do think that the receivers from Georgia dropped some passes. I mean, just straight up, they 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 dropped some passes and didn't help Carson back out in in times. But as a whole, Ole Miss's defense. I mean, they were strapped up, ready to go. And outside of the first drive, which they were inside the ten yard line, I mean, they were it was. It was goal to go when they when Georgia got their hands on the ball the first time. So I mean, there weren't really wasn't much you could do about it outside that drive. I mean, they dominated all game. I mean, it was absolutely. I I was not expecting to see that. I didn't think that it would be just a throttling on either side, but I didn't think that Georgia's offense would be stuffed in the way they were. I mean, they only ran the ball for sixty yards. Sixty yards. I mean, that's that's might be the lowest under Kirby Smart ever outside of his first season there. I, I could be wrong. I'm just that just. To me, that's one of the lowest I've seen in quite some time. And then offensively, Ole Miss, I mean, they couldn't be stopped outside of their first drive on offense. You know, had the uh, the two or the sack and the stuffed run, uh, tip pass interception that got Georgia down. That's the only time Georgia scored. That's the only time punching in the end zone was when they started inside the 10. And it took them to fourth and goal to get it in there. So, I mean, like I said, Ole Miss's defense was showing out. But Jackson Dart, you know, got injured. Came back when he got his ankle taped up. Came back and played a well of a game. Austin Simmons, when asked to his little time in the game, asked to to lead him down the field. He did just that. I mean, hit a couple passes, one big pass uh, down the seam. I mean, he looked really good. Um, but as a whole, they they dominated. 133 yards on the ground. Uh, Jackson Dart had 199 yards to the air. 263 as a team. Uh, he did throw an interception. That was the first drive. It got picked or tipped uh, before it was picked off. But I mean, they were not really – there was a couple of deep plays, like you know, of a Lane Kiffin offense. But really, it was more dink and dunk than anything. They were hitting quick out routes, hitting quick slants, uh, little dig routes, crossing routes. I mean, they were 
Jackson Dart rarely had the ball in his hands longer than three seconds. And when he did, he got sacked. And then other than that, I mean, he was getting the ball out extremely quick. They were taking advantage of of Georgia's defensive coverage uh, all night. And then they were that when they were contested and make and big plays to be made, they made the plays. I mean, not having your best receiver there and still doing that, it's it's incredible. So I mean, hats off to Lane Kiffin. You know, he this is it's not like they went into this week preparing. It's like this is the first time they prepared for Georgia. They've been preparing, like you said, for this Georgia game all off season like this they had their best game plan ready they knew exactly how they were going to attack this georgia team uh so you know hats off to them lane kiffin did a well of a job finally got his first you know big time established win as a head coach he's always been there in the big games but he's never been able to quite get over the hump and, and you know close it out so he finally gets his first big time established win as a head coach and uh you know napier's not going anywhere anymore so i think that lane kiffin's going to be an Ole miss for quite some time their future's right ahead of them, along with Georgia. Everybody's thinking, you know, this game's over, and with how or Georgia season's over. But with how this game played, you might be th- thinking that because I mean, Georgia really could not move the ball at all on offense. Uh, this is the type of defense that you're going to see in the postseason, so it, it gives you no indication that Georgia is, is going to be able to match up in in the postseason if they're able to make it there. But I don't know, man. They they got to play Tennessee this coming week. That's another really, really good defense. Uh, I mean, we're, we're going to see what happens. I know there's a, a lot that goes into that. Iamaliava might not be playing. So, uh, you know, we'll get into that later. But, I mean, Georgia's future is in front of them. Uh, Ole Miss is definitely in front of them. I think people should be higher on Ole Miss right now than Georgia just because of the way that's played. And usually, you know, how you're playing at the end of the season, it only builds and builds and builds. And if you're starting to go down, it's really hard to get it turned right back up at the end of the year. But when you're going up and up at the end of the year, man, it's easy to take off like a rocket. So um, I, I think Ole Miss is going to have a chance to be there in the end. I, I, I feel like they have a chance to, to win out and make some noise. Um, but hats off to Lane Kiffin, man. Hell of a job this season to be able to get his team back to this position and get there to still be in the hunt. Because, I mean, if they lose this game, they're out of it for sure. So to have his team still there and to dominate in the way they did, I mean, absolutely outstanding. Uh, just – I mean, chunk play after chunk play after chunk play, just little hits and dinks and dunks. I felt like – I mean, they took their big chunks here and there, but I felt like they just took what what uh, Georgia gave them over and over and over and over again, and Georgia had no way to stop them. Didn't really tackle well. Uh, didn't play with their same intensity. like the, They did not play with the same intensity uh, I felt like that they did against Texas. Uh, I didn't see that same defense this week against Ole Miss. I know the conditions were different, but I I just felt like Ole Miss was was well prepared and and you know hats off to them they executed really really well this Saturday. Yeah, I mean just I agree with everything you said. I mean, super impressive. I think looking at Ole Miss's defense too, uh, man, it makes your job as a defense coordinator for Pete Golding so much easier when your front four can get home and you don't have to send more pressure. I mean, very rarely they had to send more than four. Uh, Because those guys are so dominant up front. You know, Walter Nolan, uh, Prince of you, Mammy Ellen. I mean, Jared Ivey. uh, They bring uh, Perkins off the edge. I mean, they're just – they got so many guys and they can throw at you. So, with them not really having to blitz a ton and getting home with their front four just makes life so much easier on their defense, for their linebackers, their, their, their secondary. And um, I think you saw that pay off a lot. They tackle really well in space. Um, you know, offensively, you know, after that first possession, they got it rolling. Like you said, taking what the defense was given, the thought they took advantage of some of Georgia's zone, like you said, hitting the underneath routes, uh, getting yards after the catch were, was big. Um, yeah, it was just a really good – you know, they were able to run the ball a little more effectively than obviously than Georgia was, so – I just thought Jackson Dart played a heck of a game, made plays with his arm, um, you know, took care of the football, you know, after that tipped interception on the first drive, um, made some really nice runs with his legs as well. And and even the times he didn't take off, but being able to just step up vertically in the pocket, there was one play where he stepped up and flipped it to the, the flat. I think it was Jordan Watkins for a big game, just – just making really smart plays, just in total command of the offense. And, I mean, he, he's a gamer. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, just kind of looking at Georgia, though, 
the offensive line, you know, we've talked about it a good bit, but I mean, they are just not, they're not even bad by Georgia standards. They're not, they're not really even that great just by normal standards. I mean, honestly, this, the offensive line has struggled a lot at times this year. Um, the receivers, as you said, you know, have left a lot of plays out there. Um, so I, I don't, I want to leave with that, you know, because it's not all a Carson Beck's fault. Yeah. Uh, certainly, but he hasn't played good either. Like, I mean, he was supposed to be a strength of the team, and he's more like a liability than a strength yeah. out, out there, especially the last five or six weeks. Um, like I said, not all his fault by any means, but the whole operational offense is just not clicking from the playmakers, the offensive line, the quarterback. It, it's just – it's a total – um, you know, kind of a total disappointment across the board. It's not any one person, but – um, yeah, just you, you don't have the athletes outside that, that you've had consistently making plays. Um, and Georgia's offensive line has been so good the last couple seasons, and it's just not on that same level um, at, at a lot of times this year. Um, yeah, and defensively, I mean, I mean, still a good defense, but they just wasn't the same intensity as you had against Texas, who, again, is a really good offense, but I just think, Lane Kiffin had a really good game plan. You had a quarterback that was just really taking advantage of what was there, and I think the game plan really helped Ole Miss's offensive line out, not putting them in in bad positions. Um, you know, against against Texas, Georgia was kind of able to take advantage of some things, and they just weren't able to have those same advantages against Ole Miss and kind of the game plan that Jackson Dart was executing out there. So. Yeah, just a huge win for Ole Miss. I, I agree with your thoughts on them going forward. This is the the right time you won't be playing your best football. I mean, Ole Miss has all the pieces to make a run. Like, there's no there's no reason they can't. I mean, I would put them in a group of seven or eight teams that I think can win the whole thing. I mean, they got great they're, quarterback they're play. They're the team I don't want to play right now. No, I mean, they got great quarterback play. They are really good on defense, and they're elite on the defensive line. Like, they can get pressure on you. I mean, if you can do that to Georgia, you can – I know Georgia's offensive line have been great, but you can do that to Georgia. I mean, they've consistently gotten pressure all year long. Um, they got playmakers on the outside. They've got a couple good running backs when they're healthy. Like, they have everything – they need to to make a run like 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 you said they're not a team you're going to want to face in the playoffs assuming they went out and it's a great time for them to have a I mean you know you don't want to kill your momentum but it's a good time to have a bye week this late in the season you only got two regular season games left so um give them you know they've been a little banged up too so it's a good time for them to get healthy um kind of catch their breath a little bit so yeah this this is a team down the stretch you're not going to want to play and to be playing your best, you know, your best football here in mid-November is is definitely what you want to happen. So, yeah, just for this season, it was huge, obviously. Um, just as the program as a whole, like this was the the program kind of defining win that that Lane Kiffin's been building and been looking for. And, yeah, couldn't, couldn't have been more impressed with what they did on Saturday. Absolutely. And then I, I I'll lead us into this one because I want I want you to break it down. I want to get your thoughts. I, I want to you know share a couple things, but I, I I'll, I'll give the floor to you. Uh, obviously, Alabama goes down to LSU, Death Valley, where they really they dominate. I mean, outside of Alabama, the team struggle there. Alabama doesn't really struggle there. They they uh, that's pretty much you know second home to them. It feels like. Um, uh, there I don't know if you heard. I'm not sure which radio guy said it, but they said get down the fiddle, get down the bow. They uh, they, yeah, they hardly beat, beat Saban, Saban and, can't and they beat can't beat the bow. Yeah, yeah, whatever that, that. I don't know who said that. Hilarious, like that. Yeah. That's hilarious. But yeah, it was Chris Stewart. You know, he's the went. radio guy for Alabama now. So yeah, yeah. he's. Uh, I, I didn't know if it was him that said it or it was the, it was the 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 other guy, but hilarious either way. But. Uh, I mean, this was the Jalen Milrow show. Um, he, whatever he wanted to do, he did. I couldn't believe that they just. I mean, Bama was running the read option, and Jalen Milrow kept it every single time. It seemed like, and he would get eight eight yards, eighteen yards, 
48 yard touchdown at the same. I mean, every time they ran it, it's like he kept it. And they just kept going to the running back. They kept crashing. I was like, whatever. I mean, it's working for Bama. But I mean, they couldn't get him down even when they tried. There was a busted play that he turned into a positive gain. Uh made some big plays through the air when when necessary, but they didn't really need to. Uh I mean, they ran the ball extremely well, really with Jalen Milrow, but with everybody. When LSU had the chance to get back in the game, I believe. Yeah, so they had to get it was right before half, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. They had a chance to get back in the game, like three thirty left. They had a chance to believe it bring it within one score. Uh Nussmeyer rolls out and he fumbles the ball, gives it to Bama. Bama rolls down like three plays and scores, and it was pretty much game over after that point. I mean, LSU had their opportunity from their side of the field. Uh or excuse me, from Bama's side of the field. And they uh they blew it. I mean, they, they had their opportunity to get back in the game and really change it, get the crowd going, and it could have been a different ball game from then on. But, you know, Bama forced a turnover, ended up flipping the field, and, and LSU got the ball back with like a minute and a half to go and still couldn't punch it in. And, I mean, after Bama forced that turnover, it was, it was ball game, all she wrote. The fans were clear out of there by the middle of the third quarter. Um, uh, Nussmeyer, you know, the wheels have fallen off. I'm still hanging on. I like him, but the, the wheels have fallen off of the Nuss bus right now. He uh, has turned the ball over a lot, but I'll let you get into it and break it down and, and give your thoughts. Uh, but yeah, for sure, Bama dominated Jalen Milrow show. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a pretty good recap, much. to be honest with you. Um, yeah, what was, I mean, what was impressive to me and I thought set the tone for the game so early on is the first play was a false start and you're like, oh yeah. man, here we go again. It's going to be Tennessee. And uh, it was a second and 15, like a play later, two plays later. And uh, he he rolls out of pressure and throws it to Ryan Williams on the sideline. And it's like he just kind of settled everything down a little bit. And they got rolling on that drive and scored. And, yeah, like you said, that was the key uh, play of the game, the fumble before half. So it's 14 to 6. Alabama's moving down the field. Um, goes forward on fourth down, which I 100% – Agree with, even though they didn't yeah. get it. I, I thought it was the right call to go for it there. Yeah. Obviously, got got stuff, didn't get it. Very next play, uh, Jahai Campbell, who's played absolutely out of his mind, um, you know, is they were not the ball out of Garrett Nussmeyer's hand. Like you said, three plays later, they go score, take a 21 to six lead with about, you know, a minute or two for half. And when LSU didn't get any points there, going into half, it was, it was over. I mean, it felt Felt really good shape, no, and then it was over. Um, you know, once Alabama kind of started doing the same thing in the second half, it was it was really over then. Um, but yeah, just really impressive. I, I thought um a lot of a lot of design runs for Jalen Miro, like you said, and a lot of like there was some read option game in there, and there was just some where it was just lead running back. He was just running right behind him. Thought the backs did a great job of blocking. The tight ends have really done a great job of blocking all year. I mean, Robbie U, CJ Dupree, uh, the receivers on the outside, Kendrick Law being back in the lineup the last several weeks has really helped that. He's such a good blocker on the perimeter. Um, and then I thought Tyler Booker, um, I thought his best game in Alabama uniform, probably. I mean, it, it was up there. He was outstanding. Uh, Parker Brazerford has been a huge addition at center. He's had a great year as well. Um, a combo of those two and and Caden Proctor at left tackle, just been a really good combo up front. They've kind of had some ups and downs at, at right guard, right tackle, a little bit of banged up with Jade Roberts and Pritchett's been a little up and down here and there. But um, you you kind of see that unit rounding into form and. Um, yeah, I mean, Jalen Miller obviously making some great runs, but he said that was a big thing. He was just trusting his blocks, and they were there. You know, he was just reading it correctly, being patient, um, you know, and just being the athlete that he is. Um, I thought there were some some throws down the field. I felt like they probably would have hit if it wouldn't have been raining. You know, the weather was yeah. – Kind of bad there, the like one, it was the, the big uh, one too. Ryan Williams, he almost, I mean, a little, little bit off of his fingertips. I thought, yeah, not rainy, he probably catches that. Yeah, um, thought there were some other throws that you know might would make if the conditions were better. I thought there were some, you know, a few missed here and there, but they really didn't need it. I mean, they didn't in in the conditions. That's why, you know, I thought going into this game, Alabama could really run the football better than them, which was 
the case. And then I think the weather just played that much more into it. You know, LSU just could not run the football. When you have three turnovers, Alabama didn't turn it over. Um, that, you know, that's – I mean, that's a huge difference in the game that there. One, that one um, in the end zone, man, man, that was bad. That was bad. He threw it right to him. I mean, it was probably a read he had, and he, and he probably expected him to, to make a different read or make it or do a different – go a different way. But he misread it for sure, threw it right to – I'm not sure who the player was who intercepted it, but, I mean, threw it right to him in the end zone. Yeah, Deontay Lawson, like I said, yeah, kind of – did a good job of disguising it there, and then he, you know, went up uh, and and made a great play on it. He just, I, like you said, wasn't expecting him to be there. I think he was expecting him to, vo- you know, kind of vacate that area, and right. he was going to have to slam. And if he would have, he would have had it probably. But, uh, yeah, just kind of fooled him a little bit. And, um, yeah, it was a tough game for him. I feel like, too, I thought Alabama – did a good job of getting pressure. There was times they didn't get all the way home, but I, I did think they did a good job of affecting him. And they ran two stretch plays early in the game and hit both of them and did not run it again, which was surprising to me. I mean, LSU hit a couple big runs on those. Both both times they ran a stretch play, they hit they hit it for for big gains. And um, obviously, I'm sure the game dictated that a little bit, kind of got out of hand. But thought they would might would hit that a little bit more. But, yeah, all in all, just a really dominant performance. Uh, I feel like Alabama and Ole Miss have kind of had similar seasons. You know, I know Ole Miss didn't play a tough schedule early, but, you know, had the loss to Kentucky, which no one expected, and and they would beat them again if they played them. Same thing, Alabama at Vandy, just a game you totally didn't expect to happen. Um, You know, uh, Alabama loses a tight one at Tennessee. You know, Ole Miss – Leads the entire game at LSU, loses, you know, at, at the very end. Um, so I feel like, but but you see both of them now playing their best at the right time. You know, you see both of them kind of trending up. Um, so I feel like they they've had kind of similar seasons, and I, I feel like if, if this continues, they're going to be two teams down the stretch that you're not going to want to face. Um, I kind of felt like Alabama season would be that way. I predicted them to go ten and two in the preseason. Um, like everyone else, I did. Nobody saw the Vandy game coming. So out, outside of that, I feel like their season's been about like I thought it would be. I just thought it would be Georgia or LSU and not Vandy. They'd lose the set the other game too. Right. Um, but I I really felt like that. I mean, if we go back to the previews, I thought, hey, there'll be some struggles early. But I felt like by the time November December rolled around, they would be you know rounding into form kind of on an upward trajectory. And if they can keep this going, I think that's kind of what the case is going to be. Um, but um, since we've kind of broke down both these games, we're transitioning a little bit. The playoff rankings are out right now. Um, so I'll just kind of read them to you real quick uh, while they got them up. So SMU's at 14. They're the second team out. Georgia is the first team out. They're actually ranked 12th, but since Boise State would be ahead, Boise's the 12th seed. Um, well, they took it away right as I, I was saying it. But Ole Miss is the 11th seed. Bama's at 10. Tennessee's at 7. Texas is at 3. So those are the SEC teams right now. Who's 1 and um, 2? Oregon and who? Uh, Oregon and Ohio State are 1 and 2. Penn State's at 4. And Indiana's at 5. So Big Ten is 3. Tennessee? Uh, Texas is at three. Texas, Texas okay. Yeah. So that's kind of how it's shaking up right now. So um, the so obviously the, the bracket doesn't match exactly what the rankings are because of the automatic seeds and stuff. Because the, the, the 12 is not a ranking, it's a seeding. The rankings are the rankings. Yes, The CFP exactly. is a seeding. Exactly. Kind of like to see where everybody's right. standing right now. That way you kind of know what you got to do down the stretch. Um, yeah, so Alabama and Ole Miss, as I said, they're in at 10 and 11 right now, but they're they're on that upward trajectory. So I think it's going to be critical they can keep that going. I think their schedules are both favorable down the stretch too. Was which Indiana is in there? Say it again. Was Indiana in there? Yeah, Indiana is at five. So 
They're the, five the in the seeding. CFP seeds. Yeah, they're at five in the seeding right now. Okay. So, um, a lot of Big Ten in the top five. They they've got four of the top five in the actual seeding. So, um, but yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see down the stretch. Obviously, dominated by Big Ten and SEC, which is you know expected. Um, but yeah, I, I think at, talking about Alabama and Ole Miss, you like where they're at down the stretch with the way they're playing. Um, did want to talk a little bit about so there there's a very real possibility we're going to have a four or five team tiebreaker with two losses either for first or second. Um, you know, if if Texas and Texas A and M went out going into their matchup, the winner of that obviously will be the first place team. Um. That's assuming Tennessee loses, which we're going to preview that shortly, but Nico Imialiava is probably going to be out with a concussion. It's not looking great. So um, it really gets a wrench thrown into it if Georgia beats Tennessee this week in Athens. Um, but, yeah, kind of give me your thoughts on some of the potential tiebreakers and how it's shaping up down the stretch. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's tiebreaker central. I mean, it, there's like a, six different possibilities it could go to. Now, that's granted if – everybody is a three-way tie or a five-way tie or six-way tie, whatever happens. That's depending on certain teams losing to certain teams and there being like a potential four or five-way two-loss two team in the SEC tie. So there's there's a lot of crazy – I mean, there's even a scenario where LSU could get in. I don't know how that scenario works out. I just know that there's a possibility. Rare that it happens. Uh, but I, I do know that there's a possibility. I think the tiebreakers are crazy. Uh, but I do want to get into what you alluded to and we were talking about before we started recording, and I'll let you you uh, you know harp on it. But um, you know, there's there's a potential that the teams left out, so that there's potential that there's going to be multiple two loss teams. There's probably going to be multiple two loss teams. But there's probably going to be two two loss teams that are left out of the conference championship game. One of those two loss teams, if not both of them, have a potential of getting to the playoffs and probably will get to the playoffs, one for sure will. There are people, fans, no no coaches or players have, have been on record saying this or, or believing this or feeling like this, but there have been fans coming out saying that they would rather not go to the conference championship game, have a bye week at the house, so they make sure they don't lose and they still get into the playoffs. Cameron thinks that you that that's a whack way for the system to be set up and that there should be no way that a team that goes to the conference championship game and then loses – a two-loss team that goes to the conference championship game and loses would have three losses. But their, lo their losses in the conference championship game and an extra game and the people sitting at home on the couch, they should be rewarded for it. I'll let Cam get on it, and I, I'm, I'm with him on that. I don't think that fans – I don't think that it should be – you want to not go to the championship game. That's bad for the game. Yeah, I mean that's kind of my thoughts, and and I'm in no way criticizing the the fans' thought on this because this could be a case for multiple teams. You know, I, I'm gonna use Alabama and Ole Miss as an example because they're at number ten and number eleven right now in the in the rankings. They both have two conference losses. So let's just say, for hypothetical sake, that. Texas and Texas A&M, they went out, they play each other the last regular season game. A&M wins. A&M's there at, with one conference loss. You've got a 4-5 or five team tiebreaker for second place, which if it comes to that will probably be conference opponent winning percentage, which like Alabama would have a good chance in that tiebreaker because they have a higher strength of schedule. Um Texas, on the other hand, if they're in that tiebreaker, they, their SEC schedule was much easier than a lot of teams. So they probably wouldn't have a good chance in that scenario to go to Atlanta. So if you're Alabama Ole Miss, and the, the fans' perspective is, is well, just say at that point you're at 9 or 10 in the playoff rankings. Well, if, we, if we're second place and we go to Atlanta and lose and fall out of the playoff, we would have been better off just being – third or whatever and not going to Atlanta, which I don't agree with. I, I don't I don't disagree with that thought at all because it, it makes perfect sense. But we should never have a system where people are not wanting to go to your conference championship game right. in fear of losing and not making the playoff at all. I just think that's that's not good for for the game, in my opinion. Um, 
you know, I think you should you should always want your team to have a shot at winning the conference championship. And everybody wants that. They just don't want to miss the playoffs in the same in the same token. And I get the counter argument. Well, you know, you've already it happened got last year. It happened last year. It was a four team playoff, but it happened last year. Georgia undefeated, loses the conference championship, misses the playoffs. It happened last year. Yeah. And and we were on record back then at Green like, hey, Georgia is one of the four best teams. Like Georgia mm-hmm. should be should be in this playoff if we're just going off the four best teams in the country. They were one of the four best teams, no For doubt sure. about it. Same scenario this year, which I know it would be with two loss teams. And I get the counter argument of, well, don't lose two games before that. And I just I just don't think you should be penalized and the other teams that, that have you the have same, the same record, record as before the you're the one playing the extra game. You exactly. can't help that you have an extra game because you played well enough and you performed better than them to get to the conference championship game. You're playing an extra game than them. So if you lose one more, well, they don't have the chance to lose that game or win that game. So you don't know. So you can't say they're better than them because you don't know. Yeah. They were better than them and got met the criteria to get to the championship. They shouldn't be um they should have be benefited for that. They shouldn't have to what be penalized for. That's the word I'm looking for. They shouldn't be penalized for that. Yeah. Yeah. All in all, my point is is I just don't I just don't think it's fair to heavily penalize that team for and and they may not do that. I, I don't know. Nobody knows exactly it'll depend how, on how the game plays out. The championship game plays out for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, nobody knows for sure what the result's going to be, how the committee's going to view that. I mean, this is our first time doing this 12 team format. So they probably don't, they probably don't even know how they're going to do it yet. So um, I don't know. I just, my, my overall point is I think it's a, it's a shame and it, it hurts that we have a system where you would rather be third than second and have a chance to win the, the conference championship game. I mean, I think everyone wants to go. They just fear of losing and, and being penalizing, being out of the playoffs and kind of losing their spot uh, necessarily. So that's my whole point of it. I hope um, I hope those teams are not heavily penalized and, and that be something that ultimately makes them miss the playoff. Um, I just don't think that would be great for the game because you would have teams want to fight for third instead of want to actually be there um, and and win the and have a chance to win the SEC. Um, you know, I, I just think if you if you're already you know pretty squarely in the playoffs, you know teams are not going to want to take that risk like there is a reward of getting an automatic buy and being a top four but you don't you don't want to have that risk of missing it entirely if you lose a game you know lose the conference title game so um that's going to be a fascinating thing for sure if you allow the team that loses to get jumped by a team that didn't make it it sets a bad precedent for sure for the future of the game for a hundred percent yeah so i'm just really I guess curious and intrigued on how they're going to work that out because I know they've already thought about this scenario. You can look at the the standings and see that that's going to be a very real possibility. So I'm I'm curious to see how they work all that. Like you said, though, the result of the game will probably bear a lot of that how that works out. Um, but yeah, just SEC standings as a whole, it's going to be absolutely a dogfight down the stretch here. Oh yeah, I'm I'm excited. It's going shaping up for obviously great television. I'm here for it. Um, we were wondering what the 12 team playoff was going to bring, and it's brought a lot of drama and chaos. And I, I love it. I'm absolutely here for it. Uh, you, you know, you can get lost in all the money nil drama and all the transfer portal stuff that goes on, but at the end of the day, man, college football is still elite. It's still fun. It's not watered down in any way. It's the most exciting that it's ever been in my lifetime. I was really worried about all the new era, how it was going to affect the game. But I'm going to be honest. When it when the when the clock when when the, when the toe meets rubber and it's time to go, the game is the same game. The guys that are out there are playing their hearts out. So it's still college football, and and I love it. And like I said, it's it's more entertaining now. I feel than it's ever been. So shame on me for questioning how college football would would hold up against the new era. College football is is never going to die. It's the greatest thing in the world, and uh, 
I'm so excited that that it's panned out this way, especially in the first year. Because I mean that we got year after year after year of this to come. Because the 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 wiping out of the divisions is one of the best things that's ever happened because it creates this around week 11, week 12, the, the tie-breaking scenarios, the what if this, they look back at week six and you're like, man, if if you make that field goal or if you catch this pass or whatever, it's not even, we don't have to worry about this scenario. We're, we're sitting here undefeated or we're sitting here with one loss. Don't have to worry about it. But that's what, ah, it's the beauty of college football. I absolutely love it. Um, so, I, I mean, like I said, we were not skeptical, but we were kind of worried about how it was going to affect. And we were, you know, we've been on on record saying, you know, our our worries are there. But I, I think both of us can look back now and say that it's going to be quite all right for the years to come. Yeah, I mean it's it's going to be it's going to be fantastic down the stretch, the SEC race. Um, I do think in the in the playoff bracket, I think there's a few teams that are a little overrated, in my opinion. Uh, I don't. I, I do think some of the big team, Big Ten teams. I think Penn State and Indiana. I know Indiana is undefeated. I, I don't. I don't think they're the fifth best team in the country. We're, we're, we're think... going to find out a lot about Indiana this week. Yeah, they're playing Ohio State. Yeah. We're going to find out a lot about Indiana this week. If they get beat by a field goal, okay, I'll shut my mouth. You're good enough. If they get thumped by two touchdowns or more, I'm going to say I told you so. Not, not that I'm – hats off to them. They've done a great – they've done nothing – something that their school has never done ever in their program history. I'm a huge fan of Kurt Signetti. Love the guy to death. think he's a fantastic coach. I'm all about this Indiana football team. But people acting like they're really legitimately a top-five team is laughable because, as you alluded to last week, maybe the week before, every team on their schedule that they've played so far, not one of them has received an AP top 25 vote. Not that not one of them has been ranked. Not one of them has received a single vote. So let's it's a little different. It's not like they're they're playing the same schedule as Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, people like that. They're playing, you know, not the school of the deaf and blind now, but they ain't playing no, you know, damn good competition. So we're gonna find out this weekend just how good they are. Michigan's been down. They about pissed it away against Michigan. I took Michigan to cover, by the way. Run me my money. Um, but yes, Indiana. I mean, they, they looked good against Michigan early, but they about let it slip away. I, I think it might get ugly and out of hand this weekend against Ohio State. Maybe I'm proven wrong. Hope I am. I really like this Indiana team. I don't think I'm wrong, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking at the playoff, the playoff bracket right now as if it ended tonight. Ten seed Alabama would go on the road to Bloomington to play seven seed Indiana. I'm sorry. That's sign me up for that right now. I would take it. Um and you would have 11 seed Ole Miss, which I would love this, by the way, a big, great matchup, going to State College to play Penn State. That would be awesome. I like the road teams in, in both those. If I'm being honest, I just think they're both better teams. But I agree, there's still a lot to be proven. Um, I, I think, like you said, we'll find out a lot about Indiana. I, I, I think some of these other SEC teams are I would – ta- I would take Alabama, Ole Miss, and Georgia over Miami. I think yeah. Miami, they're they're going to win the ACC probably. Maybe I think not. That's, SMU might spank that yeah, ass. That's true. SM, yeah, I forgot about SMU. SMU may the SMU may beat them. Not beat them in the title game. They're they're number one. They stand alone atop the ACC right now. Yeah, that's true. I forgot about SMU. They but, might uh, spank that uh, ass. Think, yeah, I mean, so I I don't. I'm, I mean, Miami's. I don't want to say they're not a good team. They they are a good team, but uh, they, I don't. I don't. They're think not a national championship team. I don't think. No, I, I don't. I don't see that at all. I, I would take. I would take quite a few teams in the SEC over them tonight, a hundred percent. But yeah, gonna, gonna be interesting to see down the stretch. We can kind of get into some of these other games, but just a little food for thought and, here. And play the high state in two play. weeks. I'm sorry, not 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 next week or or in, yeah, two weeks, not next week. I'm sorry, but still, we're gonna find out a lot about them in two weeks. So. Kind of looking, want to get your thoughts on this uh, South Carolina Vandy. Oh, well, actually, we'll start with Florida Texas since they were an 11 a.m. game. Quick thoughts on on Texas Florida. What would you see from Sark and, and the Longhorns in this one? Obviously, Florida very shorthanded with all their injuries. I mean, yeah, with with, with quarterback, with Florida having to play their backup quarterback, they could not match up with with Texas offensively. 
Texas had a lot of misdirection. I mean, they that that one trick play they had a little two time misdirection. I thought that was really cool. They didn't have a lot of misdirection the whole game, but that one play they did, I thought that was a really cool uh, uh, play right there. Uh, Sarkeesian is one of the greatest at, at, at scheming up some offensive plays, uh, but they looked really good. I mean, there was nothing that Florida could do defensively. Texas was at will doing whatever they wanted to. They ran the ball well, 200-something yards running the ball. Um, Jarrett Gibson, I mean, hats off to him, had 16 carries, 100 yards, a touchdown. Quinn Ewers tossed the ball for 333 yards and five touchdowns. I mean, he was doing whatever he wanted to do. Uh um, Isaiah Bond had a couple big plays, uh, three catches for 55 yards and a touchdown. I mean, he's explosive as they come. One of the, we're, we're real familiar with him uh, around these parts. But, yeah, he, big-time player for them. I, I I didn't really watch the second half of this game because it was, it was over with. It was a snooze fest. I texted you Saturday at around, I don't know, 1 o'clock, and I said, man, this, this first game, this early morning window has been an absolute – snooze fest and by god it was i mean i was flipping around uh to some other games during this florida texas game and i didn't watch the second half of it. i mean i watched it here and there but i didn't watch a whole lot of it it was it was over with i mean there was nothing florida could do defensively no answer offensively couldn't really move the ball to get a first down it seemed like uh just i would have liked to seen it with lagway i think it would have been a lot different early but i don't think in the end it would have made much of a difference texas offense just absolutely 10 times better than Florida's defense. There's nothing you can do when the Jimmys and Joes are better than you. Uh, and, and it looked like an NFL offense going against a scout team, college football team. So that's what it seemed to me. Yeah, man, Sark had it dialed up. I mean, when yours had a ginormous game, um, what a, I said, I take you early on. I was like, I'd love to see DJ Lagway in this game after about the first drive. And then, I was like, well, it probably wouldn't have mattered because he, he <laughs> yeah. doesn't play defense. So it wouldn't have mattered. But I do think this Florida team could have been really interesting down the stretch. But the 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 bright the the lights are too bright for Aiden Gordon right now. I mean, it's just it's a tough, tough situation. Um well, like I said, I'd love to have seen DJ Lagway. I think, you know, this team could have could have been interesting down the stretch and could have made a little bit of noise and, and maybe challenged some of these teams like like they did for with Georgia for a little bit, um, for a lot of that game. But yeah, just too much Texas. Um, man, I mean, Texas is one of the most complete teams in the country right now. Um, and they're they're kind of I, I think after that Georgia loss, I think they're they're gonna be able to kind of hit their stride a little bit down the stretch, kind of leading up to that big. Uh, match up with A and M. Uh, Got to go on the road to Arkansas this week. Uh, you know, Arkansas coming off a bye. Never know what you're going to get from Arkansas if Taylor Green's healthy. You never know. Um, could could maybe keep that one interesting. But um, yeah, I, I feel like Arkansas. You get a good version sometimes, then you get the version uh, like they were against Ole Miss and just get absolutely housed. So um, We'll see kind of what happens, but I think Texas is set up pretty well down the stretch going into that game against A&M. And um, if they win that, obviously, they'll they'll be in Atlanta uh, for their first ever SEC championship game. Man, this South Carolina team, they've had some tough, tough losses this year. I mean, some really, really close losses. You think about the LSU game where they led the whole game, it seemed like. Think about the Alabama game where they had a chance there at the end. Uh, I mean, those two games, you get a play here or there, you're sitting there, and we're not talking about Alabama in this spot. We're talking about South Carolina in the spot of Alabama. I mean, they just absolutely manhandled Vanderbilt. Diego Pavia did not look like the same Diego Pavia we've seen all year. Their defensive front, just like we said week after week after week, that that might be the best defensive line in um, all of college football, not just the SEC. They had they made their way felt. Uh, offensively, they ran the ball well. Uh, Lenore Sellers, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with for the rest of his career at South Carolina. Um, but I mean, they really they they were very very obviously. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? They were a very balanced offense. But I mean, it, it's I, I think that they would have ran. I think they could have won the game without throwing a single pass. If they would have ran the ball every single play, I thought like they would have won the game. If chunk play after chunk play, they average five yards a carry as a team, 215 yards and two touchdowns on 45 carries, 43 carries, excuse me. So, I mean, 
pretty much they did run it the whole game. Lenore Sellers, I mean, he's really, really good. He's getting better and better each week. I think having that – um the game against Texas A&M a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, whatever it was, really, you know, bolstered him into the the, the confidence that he needed to take the next step. Uh, and and he, he's here to stay, and he might be one of the best quarterbacks in the future of college football. I'm excited to see what he's going to do. But, I mean, you, Shane Beamer, man, you got to take your cap off to Shane Beamer and what he's been able to do at South Carolina – the only other coach that has been able to have success at South Carolina that I can name, I know in my lifetime for sure, but that I can name ever in their school history. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but it, it's been in the modern era of college football, the only other coach that's gone to South Carolina and been successful and actually had teams that were worth a damn is Steve Spurrier. And he's one of the top coaches of college football history. Uh, not saying Shane Beamer is that. I'm just saying you have got to really, you know, sit back and acknowledge what he's done at South Carolina. I know they've got three losses and the record doesn't really show the same type of team that's on the field, but they haven't been this type of ball club since Steve Spurrier was there. I mean, these guys are hit you in the mouth, going to fight till the whistle to the end of the game. Uh, they're going to make big plays and they're not going to be scared of you. They're not, they're not the South Carolina in the last six, seven years where you're going to go in there and just whip them around the field. Uh, he's done really well recruiting. He's done really good through the portal. And I think his players really, really like him. He's got some weird, goofy moments that, you know, people are like, well, you know, why did he say that or why did he do that? I mean, I think there's some some goofy things about him. But you can't deny that that he can build a program. Um, and, and South Carolina is going to be in the mix in the future. I, I truly believe that. I, I, I really like Shane Beamer. You know, we've seen what he can do when he's got a good quarterback. He's finally starting to get pieces around him. Um, as long it, If he can get that offensive line shored up in the next few years, South Carolina is going to be really, really good. Yeah, I mean, they did a tremendous job in this game. Defensive line just keeps causing problems. I mean, Diego Pavia, who's had a great season, just never got comfortable in this game at all. I mean, they're they're good. The edge rushers obviously get all the praise. They're good at defensive tackle, too. Linebackers do a good job. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a, a well-rounded defense overall, but that, that front just creates a lot of problems for people. So good off the edge. Um, with Lenore Sellers, like you said, I just think he's continuing to, you know, obviously not a finished product at all, but you see a lot more progress in the pocket. You know, miss some throws, but you see the progress coming along. You see him getting better and better. Um, thought uh, Rocket Sanders got going more and more as the game went on. Um I mean that they went they went there to the beat and beat Vandy by three touchdowns. Alabama or Texas didn't do that. Alabama nope. didn't even come out of there. Texas didn't come out of there by a whole lot. So it was an impressive win for uh for South Carolina and uh the way they played, like you said, they're really close. They're six and three, but I don't even think that record does them justice. Like they they're, they're just uh, like on this. They're a team I do not want to play right now. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 a really solid team. Um, no doubt about it. Um, so close. I mean, two really, really close losses there. Um, yeah, they're a team that's definitely headed in in the right direction uh, down the stretch, and it's got a chance to really finish this thing off strong. So yeah, hats off to Shane Beamer what he's done, and um, yeah, if he can keep a lot of this group around, keep building with Lenore Sellers, they're definitely going to have a lot to to work with here in the future, and he's he's doing a heck of a job. Yeah, I mean, this is Shane Beamer's first ever head coaching gig, too. So, that's, I mean, that's nothing to gawk at. This dude, hats off to him. I mean, he's not going to win coach of the year, but should definitely be in the running and be in the conversation for it because no one expected them. I get I get it. The record is what it is. But no one expected them to be playing this type of game. No one would have picked them to beat Texas A&M at the beginning of the year. No one picked them to beat Texas A&M going into the game. No one would have said they would have only lost to Bama by two and had a chance to win it at the end. No one would have said they would have dominated LSU the whole entire game and then just let it slip away. I mean, no one would have given them a chance to be in any of those games. So, I mean, he should be in the, at least the conversation. I know he's not going to win it. He's not done the best job this year. He should at least be in the conversation, in my opinion. Shout out Shane Beamer. And then Tennessee and Mississippi State. I mean, about like what we talked about from Mississippi State. I feel like we haven't covered them a lot. They really haven't given us much to cover. We've covered a lot of losses for them. 
Uh, I feel bad about it, but, I mean, Tennessee, obviously the better team. Um, Nico didn't play after the second quarter, I believe. I don't, did, did that when he went down in the second quarter? Yeah, it was – so he finished 8 of 13, 174 yards. I mean, he's good when he was in there. I don't recall exactly when he went out of the game, but – um. I had this on the the my small four quad screen, and I was peeping it every once in a while. I had Mississippi State to cover, so I really was just peeping the score. There's a lot better games on at this point. I didn't really go back and watch this game. I know, I know. It's, not, I, I, it's maybe it's bad. But I just there's nothing really to cover here. It's it is what it is. An ass whooping. I watched I watched the highlights of the game, but I didn't go back and watch the whole entire game and cover it extremely well. Uh, I mean, it was the second or third I, quarter. I'm pretty positive. Yeah, I, I thought it was the second quarter, and then he didn't yeah. play again. Didn't need to play again. They ran the ball all day. Dylan Sampson just setting records left and right. Every time he scores a touchdown, he resets the record for most touchdowns scored in a season. So you know, hats off to him. He's got like 19 or 20 of them now. So I, why how he's not in the Heisman conversation is beyond me. Not saying he's going to win it or should win it, but how he's not in the conversation is crazy. I think he's got 20 touchdowns on the year, something along those lines. But Tennessee, you know, mops the floor of Mississippi State. They got their real test this week against Georgia. Uh, if they can beat Georgia, a lot of these tiebreakers won't really be a scenario, and it won't really be a big deal. But if they can't get past Georgia, then that's when all the, you know, the scenarios open up. But then, you know, Nico may not be playing this week. I've seen some reports saying he's going to play. I've seen some reports saying he's not going to play. Uh, so that's going to be a game-time decision. Georgia's a 10-point favorite right now. I'm, I'm probably not going to bet on that game at all. Because uh, I have no idea what to think. Because I don't know if Nico's going to play or not. But we'll get into that here in a minute. I do want to talk about this Oklahoma Missouri game, man. Oklahoma has just not had some things go their way. Um, kind of a lot like Auburn, been in a lot of games, and at certain times they 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 cough the ball up, turn it over, do whatever, and then they completely get themselves out of the game before it's before they uh, know what hit them. So. They come down, and they're down against Missouri. They force a turnover, score, take the lead, stop Missouri, get the ball back. They fumble it. Missouri, they're up two scores, I think, when they – or no, Missouri scored, they get the ball back. They're up a touchdown. All they got to do is run the clock out, and they win. Jackson Arnold fumbles the ball. Missouri picks it up, ends up having a game winning drive, and they win by a, a touchdown or by five, whatever it was. Yeah, touchdown. Crazy. I mean, a absolute just choke job. Oklahoma's having a brutal season right there along with Auburn. I, I understand. I feel their pain. But, man, this was one of the ugliest, sloppiest finishes. I had to go back and, and finish it because I had it on the big main screen. I was like, okay, Oklahoma's won this game. Flipped it over to a different game. Um, and then I see on the small screen that on the, one of the quad boxes it popped up that they had lost. I was like, what the heck? So I flipped it back and rewinded it and had to watch this. I could not believe it, man. One of the wildest finishes of the year for sure. Um, but Drinkwitch coming up saying, yeah, we're in a playoff hunt. Get wrecked, dude. Shut up. You are not – no, dude. You about lost to Oklahoma. You about lost to Auburn. You would get throttled by anybody that would be in the playoffs. So, I don't think they have a chance to get in. I think that's laughable that he said that. It'll work itself out for sure. But, uh, I mean, Missouri found a way to get it done. Props off – or hats off to them. Drew Pine – made a game-winning drive. He he performed one, good for him, but he definitely had some help from the other team. Yeah, so he, he led a game-time drive. Uh, that's what I mean, game-time, not game-winning, yeah, excuse me. game-time drive, and then that's when Jackson Arnold fumbled and they ran it in and went up yeah. seven and won 30-23. It was an absolute collapse of ep epic performance. I, I talked a lot of stuff about Drew Pine in, in last week's podcast. I'm, I'm going to read my text verbatim. This is my Drew Pine apology uh, segment here. So this is what I sent to you verbatim. I owe Drew Pine an apology. He let a game time drive late, and I didn't think he had it in him. <laughs> so he's not Johnny Unitas, but he went 14 to 27, 143 yards and three touchdowns, no picks. That's a hell of a night for him. Yeah. That 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 is my Drew Pine apology. He's down seven. Got my cousin over at the house. He's like, I got Missouri. I was like, you can forget it. Drew Pine is not leading the game time drive. He, they're down seven. You forget that parlay. It's over. Leads him down the field. 
Then they end up getting the strip sack of Jackson Hall, score, win the game. I said, well, I, I got to apologize to him. He did it. <laughs> he was absolutely terrible the other times I saw him. He he was pretty decent the other night. I mean, he he really was. He was pretty decent. I didn't, especially against this defense, I didn't think he could do it. Um, he did it. They won the game. I mean, like I said, nothing, nothing crazy, but he, he got the job done. He, I thought they did a good job of helping him out. Um, he, he didn't throw it to the, to the red and white team, which is good. Uh, he threw it to his team. Um, and if he didn't, it was incomplete. So that, that was, uh, very, that, that was very good. Um, Oklahoma, I mean, like you said, Oklahoma was in position. They just didn't close this game. Out. Um, you know, kind of just like Auburn was in position against Missouri and didn't close it out. Oklahoma, very, very similar type of scenario, just not able to get it done. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of my thoughts on it. But yeah, I mean, I mean, credit to Missouri though they're seven and two. Um, you know, still alive. I mean, they're they're the one two loss team that I don't think has a a chance. Just think, if it comes to that tiebreaker. That this their schedule does not favor them in that kind of scenario, so I, I they don't have a chance to really get to Atlanta even in a tiebreaker scenario, um, and I don't believe they would have a chance if they got there anyway, which is not going to happen. So, um, yeah, but I mean, still still in line for a really good season though, which I mean is important. They're trying to build momentum there after a ten win season, and they're still going to have a really good finish more than likely. So that that's that's really big for the program. Absolutely. Um, all right, going into the next week or this coming weekend, uh, Texas and Arkansas. You know, Arkansas had a strong start to the season, but they've kind of tailed off Texas' offense. I think it's going to be too much. Texas is a 13-and-a-half point favorite. I think Texas covers. What do you think? Arkansas is a yeah. plus 400 money line. Yeah, I think um, I would I would lean the Texas cover. Um, I feel like the line is about right. I think two touchdowns is pretty fair on the road. Arkansas off a of bye. I think it really depends on what kind of Taylor Green. Like, if you get a healthy Taylor Green, I feel like Arkansas can be pretty competitive in this game. But if he's not or has an off night, I just think Texas is too complete on both sides of the ball. Um, so yeah, I would I would lean Texas to cover. I think I think the line's pretty close. Um, I, I would love to see a healthy Taylor Green in this game just to to have a chance to make it competitive um so so we'll kind of see where they're at coming off the bye but the way texas is playing and what they have on both sides of the ball it's gonna be gonna be a tough kind of uphill battle for arkansas even at home uh the way they're playing but yeah hopefully taylor green's healthy where we can you know feel like kind of get a competitive ball game here a little bit and then lsu is a four and a half point favorite going to florida uh Hammer that. I think Florida or I think LSU wins. I think LSU covers four and a half. I know it's in the swamp. Uh I don't know if, I don't think Lagway's playing. Um, so I, I, I hammer LSU. Yeah, I as I said before, I, I think if Lagway wouldn't have got hurt, I think they could have made some noise down the stretch. I think this is the type of game they could have. I just don't think with Aiden Warner in there, I just don't think they have the ability offensively. Um think their defense can can keep them in it early a little bit potentially. Um but yeah if this was a lagway game I, I could you could sell me on Florida pulling an upset potentially. I just without it they just don't have the pieces offensively. Um so yeah I, I like LSU in this game as well. South Carolina take out a second mortgage lay the negative or lay the minus twelve. South Carolina is going to cover that four times. Drew Pine going hey, against the best defensive front in the nation. Do what? You think they're going to cover it by 48 four yeah. times? Yes. 12 and a half four times is like 50, yeah. I think. <laughs> this defensive front facing Drew Pine. That's true, yeah. Drew Pine is going to be seeing ghosts. Cause, and then the North Sellers, Rocket Sanders, yeah. Write it in pen because – they're covering. So so you're telling me I should go ahead and At rescind? Home, you're telling me I should rescind my Drew Pine apology then? I don't think you should rescind it. I think it was well-deserved, well-earned. He he, he, yeah. he deserved that apology. But uh, 
you're going to be able to rehash him on a different subject this coming week or the same yeah. subject, but a different time this coming weekend. It's going to get ugly. Dude, at, at South Carolina, bro, get cocky. Let's go. Yeah, Tennessee, I mean, Georgia. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I, I, I want to I hear your opinions on that. I, I, didn't, I didn't let you do that. No, you're fine. I, I agree with you. I, I, I think this defensive front especially is just way too much for Missouri and the way South Carolina is playing. Um, I, I think – um, I think Missouri's a, a a little bit of a fraudulent seven and two. Like I, no, not a like, bit, a lot of like. Bit. Okay, yeah, that I was trying to be nice. That you're <laughs> right. Um, yeah, South Carolina with with three conference losses, I think, is a much better team than Missouri. I think they show that Saturday. I think they get after Drew Pine. Uh, it's going to be ghost town uh, for him. And yeah, <laughs> I think I think they get this run game going downhill, uh, kind of like Alabama did against uh, Missouri. Yeah, I, I like South Carolina to to roll here. And then Georgia, Tennessee, Georgia between the hedges. They get the, huge having this game at home. Really huge having Nico potentially being out if he's out. That's really big for them. But minus ten, I don't know. I can Georgia move the football? I mean, they faced a really good defensive front last week. Tennessee's defense is really good. I think they're I think they're a little weaker in the secondary than Ole Miss, but I don't think that that makes them weak at all. But I, this defense is really good. It's the strength of their team. Can Georgia move the football? I know it's at home, but that don't mean anything. I, if Georgia can move the football, I think they cover. I don't know that Georgia can move the football. I'm staying away from this game. Over under 48 and a half. Mm. Mm, probably taking the under. Yeah, I like Georgia to win this game. I, I believe, I, I obviously, Nico's status being up in the air. I just I have a hard time seeing Georgia losing back to back, especially this being at home. I just think Georgia throws a wrench even more in the SEC title race, uh, giving Tennessee a second loss here. Um, no, your points are a hundred percent valid though. I'm kind of just going off that based on I just don't think Georgia's going to lose back to back. This one being in Athens, but yeah, if their offense like their offensive line needs to be much better. This is a very very good Tennessee front. Um, Ole Miss was a great front. This is a really good front as well. Um, so they get they got to get some things figured out. Carson Beck's got to not throw the ball to the other team, which has been a huge issue the last six weeks. Yeah. Um, you know they got to have some guys step up on the perimeter and and catch the football because that's what you got to do as a receiver. You got to catch the football, and they're not doing that well enough right now. Um, so yeah, they they got some issues to fix for sure. I just. I think Kirby has them ready with the playoff rankings. Everything's still ahead of them if they win out. So um, I, I think between the hedges, I, I think they get back right a little bit. I'm like you. I'm not taking the line at all. I'm totally staying away from the line, but making a game pick, I do. Th I think Georgia wins this game, especially with Nico's status being up in the air. Um I think they should be able to to slow down that run a little more, especially if he's if he is out. Um, so I'm I'm gonna go Georgia to win, but as far as the line, I'm gonna stay away. There's just too many unknowns for me here. Absolutely. So if Tennessee wins, they'll be nine and one, and if LSU and excuse me, if Tennessee Tennessee wins, they'll be nine and one. And then yeah, if yeah. Texas and Texas and m went out to the champion till their game at the end of the year, whatever team wins that will have one loss, and it'll be them in Tennessee, and the tiebreakers will be for not. Yeah. That's no fun. So I'm hoping for a Georgia victory so we can get chaos at the end of the year and see how hell break loose. That's what I want to happen. So I'm gonna pick Georgia to win the game. I really do think they win it. They're at home. I don't think I don't know about the line staying away from it completely. I do think they win the game. Like you said, I don't see Georgia getting beat two times in a row. Um uh, especially at home. They they know the magnitude of this game. This is a game they've had circled for a while. Uh, so I, I don't see Georgia losing this game. I think they're going to win. Uh, and I really want them to win just so all hell will break loose. Yeah, I mean, you make a great point. I mean, if Tennessee wins this game, it, you know, assuming they beat Vanderbilt the last week of the season, they'll, it'll be Tennessee and the winner of Texas and Texas A&M will be playing in Atlanta. So that that will very much simplify things if that happens. Like we're saying, we think that's not going to happen. We're picking Georgia to win this game. And if that happens, 
that's when the wrench really gets right. thrown into things because that guarantees um, the second place team is going to have two losses and you're likely going to have probably four or five at least teams that are tied with two conference losses. That's when the tiebreaker scenarios kick in and that's where it gets really wacky. So, yeah, so to to get that wacky scenario, we pretty much have to have Georgia beat Tennessee which I, I feel is pretty likely going to happen. And if that is the case, then, yeah, we're, we're going to have a lot to talk about next week and in the, in the following week uh, before we head into conference championship week. So um, stay tuned in to us here at Saturdays in the SEC. Like and subscribe to the channel. We really uh, would appreciate that. And, and feel free to comment down below uh, your thoughts on it, playoffs, conference title race, or otherwise. Um, anything you'd like to hear us talk about more, we'd love the feedback would be great. You can follow us on Twitter at Saturdays underscore SEC. Uh, yeah, keep it locked in uh, here with us because it's going to be a wild race uh, down the stretch and hope you all have a, a great rest of your week and a great Saturday uh, this upcoming weekend. Absolutely. Thank you, guys.